So the reason I wanted to invite these guests today is a lot of the Battle of Ideas is obviously about debate and hearing different sides of the story. And this is a show about free speech. Now, recently, there have been some overtures made by the government insofar as they want to introduce legislation uh, to, to tackle the problem of the threat to free speech on university campuses. There's a couple of questions going on here. Uh, firstly, to what extent is there a problem with free speech? Uh, in higher education? And secondly, whether the best remedy to that is through the government. In other words, is it right that we should be imposing uh, a kind of restrictions on censorship? It feels weirdly counterintuitive, and I'm not sure where I stand on this, and that's why I wanted my guests here today. Uh, let's hear from you uh, first, Eric Kaufman. What do, what do you make of this? Well, I, I think it's very important for people to understand that the government can protect and advance freedom. Okay, and that's very tough, particularly for some libertarians, to grasp. Now, how does that work? You've got to understand society has got three levels. There's the government, institutions, and individuals. If the threat to freedom is coming from that middle layer of institutions, the government can have a role in actually protecting the citizens from those institutions. And the authoritarianism and the liberalism that we have is now strongest out of these institutions, such as universities, perhaps tech firms, perhaps other kinds of organizations that wear this ideology of wokeness, which I would define as essentially the sacralization of historically marginalized uh, race, gender, and sexual identity groups. That's wokeness in a sentence. But that <laughs> is essentially coming from these institutions, right? So we need, in some cases, the government to be able to check those institutions from oppressing individuals' freedom inside them. And that's why we need this legislation. That's actually incredibly clear. Thank you for that. You Thank you. You could have done with a diagram, actually. <laughs> yeah, that would have been yeah, great. Yeah, that would be. I usually use diagrams in teaching, right? Yeah, so. that was very good. OK, well, let's hear from Dennis Hayes about that. What, what do you make of that? Well, I've only been called an anarchist twice. Once was today and once by a member of the European Commission. And the reason <laughs> is I don't trust the state. And mm. If you believe that the state is going to um, protect your freedoms, that's a step towards civility. Yes. So it's being servile, not um, freedom. But today I've been listening to people talking about academics and they really worry me because they've been described as fearful, right? afraid, afraid to put their heads over the parapet, uh, lacking confidence by people who put in the argument for um, protection. Now, that's a really funny thing, because academics have quite a good life. You know, they, they get a decent salary. They've, they've got lots of influence and power. But suddenly, they're presented as fragile. We've got them playing the victim card to get the legislation in. So basically, you're saying that academics can't cope. They can't... But there, OK, but there has been research, hasn't there? I mean, the Policy Exchange put some research out on this that does show that a significant proportion of academics have a particular political bent are afraid to express their opinions on, for instance, Brexit and that kind of thing, because they fear that that will affect their pro promotional prospects. And I mean, that's very real, isn't it? That's really happening. Well, that, well, that's part of the issue, is that they don't express those views, but that's to do with the different climate in universities. I, I don't think it's the particular political issues that are behind it. We live in a, what I would call a therapy culture. Yes. So people are frightened of giving emotional offence to anybody else, and that's the climate that's created wokeism in, in the way, because if you present yourself as a victim, and you, know, you, you say that, you know, I've been offended, it makes you incredibly strong, because you can't be challenged. Yes. And if you challenge them, then you're an oppressor. So that's that's, that's the dynamic that goes on. So you, they've gathered confidence and now they've got the moral high ground, but it's based fundamentally on this do not, never offend, never upset anybody. So do you think, are you making the claim, therefore, that the academics who claim to be, claim that they are being silenced are in a way uh, playing the victim for the purposes of power? Because that's, that's, that's from that woke playbook, isn't it? Well, I think they can do that. I mean, that's, that's where you get power. You play the victim card and you will always get... And attention. Do you think, Eric Hoffman, that, uh, that, that Dennis has got a point that, you know, that, that in a sense the academics are at fault for just not being open and honest about what they think and they shouldn't, they shouldn't be in fear? Well, I mean, yes, we can have this idealist picture of the virtuous academic, what they should be, but I think we're dealing with a collective action problem and we have to deal with people as they are and I just don't think if we wait for the day when all academics somehow discover their inner courage and rise up, I just don't think that's going to happen anytime soon and in fact, this is a really important point, this problem is going to get worse, it's not going to get better and one of the reasons is because it's very generational. If you take academics under the age of 35 and over the age of 50, the academics under 35 are twice as censorious, twice as likely to back cancel campaigns as those over 50. Not because they're academics, it's the same pattern outside academia. So we have a generation that's entering the profession and all organizations that is much more intolerant 
Just to give you a statistic, by the way, from the FIRE, the Foundation of Individual Rights in Education, did a survey of 37,000, I think, students that found seven in 10 of them believe that if a professor says something that offends the student, that professor should be reported to the university. Okay. This is the generation that's coming in. The problem is going to get worse. Don't believe it's going to be a blip. I mean, that yeah. is significant as well. And, and within that research, there was also quite a shocking statistic about, I think it was 23% of students who, under certain circumstances, would accept as moral the idea of using physical violence uh, against a, uh, a speaker who is expressing problematic views. Do you think... So, Dennis Hayes, I mean, let me put that to you. Do you accept that there is a problem within the culture of higher education that will potentially lead to the silencing of academic discourse? Do you accept that that's true? Um, well, I run the ban list of academics. So you know, for years we've been tracking this. You know, for at least 16 years I've been monitoring all these cases. Yeah, so, so you know it's I, real. I, I know it's real, but... What, and Eric and I were talking about this before. And there's been a sort of a change in young people's attitudes. So mm. people are setting up free speech groups, you know, liberate the debate, we're here. And th so there is something different, despite all those stats. And I think, so the, I used to be really depressed about this. I think, my God, we, we will be doomed in the future. But um, young people are proving me wrong. And I think mm. that's, so that is really healthy. But I'll just say one thing, the, the depressing thing for me is what this new legislation will do. Because I've been involved in many, many cases, you know, and if you think it's great fun being involved in a complaints procedure and then going to court, you know, and months and months in complaints procedure. So what will happen when this legislation comes in and we have the Director of Free Speech and Academic Freedom uh, overseeing a complaints procedure is that the debate will go and it will go in to a legalistic, quasi-legalistic complaints procedure. And the lawyers love it, you know. They'll all love it and all support it. Because that's how they make their living. And they think that will be a, re a resolution, but it won't because it will take it away. Because the universities already have confidentiality clauses. So a lot of the cases we um, take up, and the Free Speech Union, uh, we being academics for academic freedom, um, we can't make them public because making a case public if somebody's being disciplined for what they've said is another disciplinary charge. Right. Do, do, can you come back on this, Eric? Because I suspect you want to. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I just think you have to think back. I mean, if we look, consider the time, in 1960, University of Mississippi, they didn't allow black students in. The federal government essentially desegregated the universities. I don't think there are many people who would say that was a bad idea, right? We could have allowed those black students and people within the university to eventually come up with their own self-generated solution. But I think in, in some cases, it is definitely the case that government has a role, really. Uh, and it, well, that's a very specific instance. I mean, right. is, isn't right. Dennis right to say that we should mistrust the state, ultimately? Uh, I don't think so. So, so I, I'm obviously, the state can, can overreach. But the one thing about elected government is they are scrutinized by the media. This is a much more transparent entity than organizations and universities that make decisions behind closed doors that are not subject to scrutiny. So let's, by all means, if people want to vote and see that these institutions are persecuting people for their views and they accept that, great. That's out in the democratic debate and fine. I think that's just much more open. But is, there, is the better way to actually persuade the next generation that it's better to have open and honest discourse? Is that not the better way to do it? But let me, the only thing I'd say is, yes, Dennis is right that we have to get a free speech culture in the population, but that's a long project. As I said, the generations coming up are much more intolerant. In the next 20, 30, 40 years, are we going to just say, well, we're going to sacrifice all of these academics who dissent to the cancel culture? I think that's not right. I think we need to have a solution for the next, say, 20, 30 years that protects people from this intolerance, which is going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah, but, uh, oh, sorry, Dennis, well, I'll go to you. I'm, I'm with the rebels in um, Shakespeare's Henry VI, because they said if you want um, social change, the first thing you do is kill all the lawyers. I, mean, that, no, yeah. I think, um, <laughs> you said I can say anything, but obviously the lawyers will now That's sue. not incitement to violence, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but, I, yeah, it's, just, it's a long-term project, but the, the fight for free speech is constant. You've got to constantly fight it. And I think what's changed is that a lot of groups and, you know, and academic campaigners have given up. They've just given up and decided you know, to let the state try and do it. And it won't do it. The state will not protect your rights. We already got the, the changes that are being made, apart from the litigation and bringing student unions within the remit of free speech, are all about complaints. And that's not going to be a healthy future.
I mean, this is, this is the kind of argument that you get with affirmative action and, and positive discrimination. It's like the situation is so dire that we need some intervention to sort of boost it for the time being. So that's your view on, the, on those things. Not on affirmative action, but don't forget... Same principle, though, isn't it? It isn't the same principle because affirmative action is essentially an illiberal discriminatory principle, whereas the, this academic freedom bill is working with the grain of existing laws. Universities are essentially perverting the law in order to implement their interpretation of the law, which privileges certain forms of equality over free speech. All the government is going to do is proactively ensure that they are obeying the law and not violating the law. And they have to do this proactively. It's not enough but, to wait to sue. OK, um, but don't you take the point that, I mean, as Dennis has been pointing out, that actually there are all these groups popping up. I've been speaking to some today. Free Speech Champions is a group of young people who are, who, are, who are trying to fight back against this culture. And they said to me, as the, the, the people I was talking to, that actually it's a minority of, of, of students students and young people, then actually the, the, we have more reason, I suppose, to be optimistic than you imply. Um, well, I actually don't agree with that. I mean, I think that a small group of very, we see this with the trans lobby, a small group that's very committed, knows the pressure points, can, can move mountains. Partly that's because of these taboos against racism, transphobia, etc. If they can key into those taboos, they can shut down nine out of ten people. And so they can silence all the resistance to this in committee meetings. I've been in these committee meetings. Uh, no one will say anything. You need the government to be able to come in and, and put in these legislations, which means that when the activists come and start pushing on the administrators, the administrators can say, you know, we'd love to do that, but our hands are tied by this legislation, and so we can't accede to canceling this person. And this, is a, this problem is getting a lot worse. The number of uh, attempts to fire academic staff has jumped fivefold between 2015 and 2020 in the FIRE database. So this is a rapidly escalating problem. We have to get real about what I, I, I support all of the grassroots efforts, but actually, in terms of changing the pattern, we can, we're going to need to bring in but, government. Okay, but it's not just grassroots. Is it? There, is, there are signs that actually, in terms of a top-down kind of uh, approach, we were talking earlier about Kathleen Stocks. The university, uh, the vice chancellor, did stand up and say, no, we are absolutely not. Isn't that not a sign that we are moving in the right direction, Dennis? Yeah, but Libra, the debate pointed out that that vice chancellor didn't defend their right to have speakers about three years ago. So it's, is you know, that it's, right? Yeah, it's absolutely right. And I think, uh, I think we do get a lot of support from some vice chancellors. But one of the things that universities are good at is bypassing legislation. You know, they mm. can get around everything by committees. So the idea, and, and, and to give you an example, and it's one that people are less uh, familiar with, is the David Miller case at Bristol, who has just been. Um, Sacked, or is about to be sacked, it's still in appeal. So, amazingly, the lawyers have actually, the university has made a statement while it's still going in process. You know, whatever you think of him, he's not a, a defender of free speech in any way. But, you know, what they will do is what they've done to him is divide free speech from behaviour. So, they'll say, it wasn't your speech, it was, you know, how you made students feel uncomfortable and that so this divides speech and behavior they do that all the time so they'll say it's not your speech that's fine it's you, you didn't meet our professional standards okay. and those are the sort of debates we're going to be mired in for years and years because of this legislation well, we do have to wrap this up so final thought to you on that eric um I, I just think once the director of academic freedom is in place they can issue guidance they can find universities universities are under obligation to not just protect but promote free speech they won't be able to get away with those sorts of things this is absolutely vital for the health of free inquiry and rational debate. Right now, the universities are being perverted away from their truth-seeking mission. I think this is absolutely vital legislation.